I really don't want to tell you this story, but I feel like I have to, and you'll see why. You probably know who John Edward is, the medium who crosses over and communicates with dead people in the spirit world. Well, my friend told me she was going to see him when he came through our town at the Marriott, and so I said, you know what, I'll buy a ticket too, because I was bored, I had nothing else to do, and she had hopes of him communicating with her lost loved ones, but I had no expectations at all. It was just fun for me, but in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, I don't fully believe in this stuff, but it would be kind of cool if my best friend came through that died nine years ago. So in a room of about 800 people, John Edward pointed to my area of the audience and he said, there's someone with the initial L coming through. She has a very wild personality and he waves his hands through the air as he says that. And he goes, yeah, she's someone that was constantly stealing things from other people. She lived a very crazy life and may have been mentally challenged. So as he was describing my late sister Lorraine in full detail, I was too shocked to actually claim it. My jaw just dropped and the lady sitting in the chair directly in front of me stood up and said yes, yes, yes to everything he said about her with no real validation or conviction. As I watched her claim that spirit, I knew it was just because she wanted to, she wanted it to be her message or maybe she wanted to be in the spotlight, but you can tell it, it wasn't really ringing with her. And I wanted to say, no, it was my sister Lorraine coming through, but I stayed quiet instead, not to be rude or call that woman out for faking it. I believe I might be what they call an intuitive empath because I get a lot of premonitions like being forewarned about things that are going to happen and then they happen. For example, um, I became a germaphobe like a month before COVID was ever announced and I was telling everyone, use your hand gel, wash your hands, really be careful of germs. And people were looking at me like I was crazy. And then one month later, COVID was announced for the first time. <laughs> but I mean, it's kind of good to have that forewarning, but I never really cared to learn about this sixth sense or intuition or whatever it is. I never like tried to develop it further. I believe it was that spiritual connection through John Edward that made me feel the urgency to tell Lorraine's story publicly. I believe that's what she wants. Lorraine was my parents' fourth child and they were living in the housing projects in Patterson and my uncle felt bad so he bought a big house for everyone to move into. But before they could move out of the projects, Lorraine was chased by my mother's friend's son and she tripped and fell down a flight of cement stairs and was completely in a coma afterwards. They didn't think she was going to survive. Soon after four-year-old Lorraine was rushed to the hospital, a priest was called in to give her her last rites as the church called it because the doctors said they didn't think she was going to make it through the night. Even though the doctors told my parents to prepare for her death, she somehow came out of the coma and survived, but it was soon evident that she had permanent brain damage. So a normal, healthy, happy young girl's life was permanently brought to an end at age four when she had that fall down the stairs and her brain was injured. So imagine coming home from the hospital with a totally different brain. Her perception of the world was different from her friends and family and she suddenly felt like a misfit living in a world she couldn't fully understand. But she had her own agenda that only she understood. All she ever wanted was to fit in without being laughed at because of behaviors she could no longer control. But, you know, back then in the 60s, there was no help for mentally disabled children. Parents could either commit them to an institution or keep them. And our mother decided to keep her. 
caring for seven other siblings, there wasn't enough time left to help Lorraine learn how to live with her damaged brain. And she had to learn to adapt to a different world where people now look at her strange and they run from her because of her brain damage and lack of impulse control and her silly behaviors that people just couldn't understand. Just like other children, Lorraine had dreams too. She wanted to be a ballerina and my mother wanted her to take dance and lessons. Even though she couldn't be a ballerina, she wanted her to enjoy the fantasy. One of her odd behaviors was that she used to smear her feces on the wall with her fingers, like a child finger painting. She had no fear or shame at all, as if that part of her brain was missing. And she would proudly own up to it. Being so young, I saw the poop wall and I had no idea what was wrong with her, only that she was unpredictable. I was a little afraid of her, but, you know, I just took a step back and tried to make sense of it all. I didn't learn about her accident until years later, my aunt told me what happened. So I always wondered what she would have been like if she didn't have that fall. This is a Google Maps photo of the home that we grew up in, and it's still standing. Everything looks exactly the same as it did back then, except the white fence that was not there. So that's me on the right, bundled up in I don't know how many layers because my mother used to overprotect me. And I'm standing next to my sister, Barbara, who was, uh, I think, a year older than Lorraine. And that's at the big house my uncle bought for us. I found this photo from 1965. Can you believe it? So there I am on the left. I'm about five years old and Lorraine is on the right and she's about 10 years old. Lorraine confided in me one day and told me that she never told anyone else this, but years ago when she was 12, she was walking to the local drugstore to get something for her grandmother and two men pulled her into a backyard and raped her. She had no idea what was happening to her. She didn't even know what sex was at such a young age. She said that after they were finished, one of the men held a knife to her throat, telling her that he was sorry, but he had to kill her. She begged for her life, promising that she would never tell anyone what happened. And the other guy said, no, don't kill her. And she said the hardest part was laying on the ground and wondering if she was going to live or die or what she even did to deserve this. And then finally, they decided to let her live. I found this old picture. There's Lorraine all the way to the left and our other sister and brother in the middle. And that's me all the way to the right. Yes, that was my haircut. <laughs> One day Lorraine asked me if she could go to church with me. So I said, sure. But during the church sermon, I couldn't find her anywhere. I asked her later that day where she went and she said she was in the coat room pickpocketing from all the coats. She thought that was hilariously funny too. So as Lorraine was transitioning into a young woman, we, every day was a new adventure and we just had to play it by ear, not knowing what to expect from her. But I think the main difference between somebody who actually had a physical brain injury um, compared to someone who was born with like uh, mental ret retardation or something like that is her higher level of awareness. So Lorraine was very clever and shrewd with street smarts most of the time, but she had lack of control of her impulsive childlike behaviors and her silly inaudible sounds that would just randomly come out and make people either laugh, move away, or just stare in shock. So here's an example of how Lorraine was even smarter than me. When I was 19, I got my first car. It was a 1970 Mustang convertible. And Lorraine said to me, if you let me use your car to just drive a few blocks away, I'll pay to fill up your gas tank. So I said, yeah, right. Ha uh ha, -huh, funny. <laughs> so she said, I'll fill your gas tank up first if you don't believe me. So I said, really? Okay, fine. Because it was during the gas shortages in 1979. I was like, all right. So I just knew there had to be a hidden agenda because she was so clever, but I couldn't figure out what it could be because she was filling my gas tank up first. So, uh, she actually did fill up my gas tank. Like she said, and I said, here, here's the keys, take the car, go where you need to go. So she took the car 
And she returned it right away with within the hour, as she promised. And I thought to myself, wow, no catch. I was really impressed, thinking, well, m maybe she really did change. But the next morning I woke up and my car was missing. <laughs> it was later found in New York City, illegally parked and towed away. I had to pay hundreds to get it back from the towing yard and settle the parking ticket, too. <laughs> Lorraine never tried to deny anything she did wrong. She would always admit to everything and just laugh uncontrollably about what she did. That's why I know for a fact that she was telling the truth when she told the story of what really happened in the Alexander Hamilton Hotel lobby one day. So Lorraine told me what really happened. She said a man was standing with his wallet in his hand and a woman grabbed his wallet and hit him over the head and ran. When the man got up off the floor, he saw Lorraine standing there and just pointed to her and said, she did it. Lorraine said, why would I just be standing around in the lobby if I did that? I saw the woman that did it and she ran away. So if they knew Lorraine, they would have known that she wasn't lying, but the man wanted someone to pay for his pain and humiliation so Lorraine became the real victim. Lorraine was sent to Rikers Island prison for a crime she did not commit. The thing they didn't realize is that Lorraine would have blatantly admitted to it if she did it because she had no fear or shame whatsoever. I don't remember how much time she spent as an inmate, but she actually escaped Rikers Island prison somehow by hiding on a boat, she told me. I remember being a kid outside of my home one day and two big men came up to me and asked me if I was Lorraine. And I said, no. And they said, show me your ID or we're taking you in. I had no idea what was going on. Then my mother came outside of the house and she said, leave my daughter alone. She's only 14. She doesn't have any idea yet. She's not Lorraine. Later I was told that they were bounty hunters, and I was afraid to go outside again for quite a while. Lorraine spent the rest of her years as a fugitive and was never caught by them. So even though Lorraine was hiding out in New York City as a fugitive, she got homesick every now and then and she would come and visit us. So whenever she came home to visit, everyone would nervously hide all their valuables, but that didn't stop her. One day, Lorraine said to me, nice purse. And the next day I found the contents of my purse all over the bedroom floor and the purse was missing. My coat was missing too. Uh, she never tried to hide any of her thievery. She was proud of it and she would just giggle and laugh uncontrollably like a child when we caught her, except with no fear, shame or regret. It was like that part of her brain was just missing. So this is why we still loved her no matter what she did. And we tried to understand her better, but we were limited to what we could do to actually help her. All Lorraine ever hoped for was a way to be accepted and blend in. So most people didn't want to be near her because she always seemed to leave some sort of destruction in her path. So she would try so hard to fit in only to be rejected every time. The only time she wasn't rejected was men who found her sexy. So flirting with men was the only way she knew that she could make herself feel wanted. So that's what she learned. She was naturally very quick-witted and knew how to hustle anything she wanted. She once walked up to an old man on a bench and flirted with him with a little lap dance. She then took his eyeglasses off of him and gazed into his eyes. He was giggling and excited by the flirtation until she said, nice glasses. Then he said, oh, be careful with them. They cost me $300. And she replied, well, now they're only gonna cost you $20. So the man had to give her $20 to get them back. Only Lorraine could make a hustle look like a bargain. <laughs> she danced in a New York City go-go bar to escape the bounty hunters in New Jersey. She told me stories about how the bar owner trained her to hustle drinks. She was taught to walk up to a guy after her dance set and say, would you like to buy me a drink? Of course, the guys always said yes to a sexy, half-dressed young woman. 
So she would sit down with him at a table and he would order a drink for himself and she would order a $500 bottle of champagne for herself, which was really sparkling water poured into an expensive champagne bottle, but the guy didn't know that. When the huge bill came, the guy typically tried to argue it with the manager, but was told that he had no choice but to pay it or be beaten up by the bouncer out back. Clueless men typically fall for this bar scam easily, she told me. The bar manager knows that men will never embarrass themselves by disputing it legally afterwards, so they get away with it every time. She was also encouraged to allow men to buy her shots, but in order to do that 50 times in a night, she was taught to pretend that she was drinking the shot and then chasing it down with a beer. But the beer bottle was a trick because it was really used to spit the shot out into the bottle. She told me that dancers only make part of their money dancing and the other part entertaining privately in the back room. Eventually, she learned that the only way someone with a brain injury could earn enough money to survive on is to sell her own body. One day someone she met let her try heroin and she came to visit us that day and I remember her saying, I tried heroin for the first time and it made me feel like I fit in with everyone else, like magic. She eventually went from pole dancing to being a hooker so she could have her heroin and feel normal, as she claimed. She was known on the streets as Pepsi and never used her real name, even when arrested many times. Underneath her childlike brain emerged a street smart woman. She refused to allow a pimp into her life and she chose to be her own manager instead. She didn't need a manager because she was completely fearless. So she went from pole dancing to working the streets at the pier in New York City. Not many people knew her real name on the streets because her street name was Pepsi. I lived a very sheltered life, staying at home mostly because my parents were overprotecting me because of the high crime neighborhood we lived in but Lorraine told me what real street life was like. Taming Lorraine was something our parents or anyone else could not do. Everyone tried. So eventually Lorraine tested positive for HIV from shared needles. And soon after she met a man named Kevin who she fell in love with and he also was HIV positive. And they ended up getting married. Uh, my oldest sister Elaine a nurse in Florida arranged for them to have a wedding and a small reception at her church. I remembered as children, Lorraine used to put a half slip over her head and pretend it was a wedding veil and fantasize about getting married when she got older. A few years later, Lorraine sadly woke up and found Kevin dead next to her. He had died of a heroin overdose. She was now a widow. Lorraine then decided to go to rehab clinics to try and get off of heroin. Like any other addiction, each attempt didn't last and she tried it with multiple times over the years. She told me that she used to go to Times Square Church every day to pray, but she also admitted that she and the other homeless people used to pickpocket church employees coats and purses too. Eventually the church started offering them food so they wouldn't have to steal anymore. One day, a van pulled up next to Lorraine by the piers in New York City, and three men pulled her into the van and raped her. As they threw her out of the moving van afterwards, which also broke her arm, she yelled back at them, the joke's on you, I have AIDS. An incident like this would have set a normal person back for years to come, but Lorraine just brushed it off and moved on. Living the street life was about survival and it seemed to make her tougher and more resilient to emotional pain. I only saw her on brief visits though, so I really don't know how bad she suffered with emotional pain. 
About a year after our father passed away from a stroke, our mother was in the hospital dying of stomach cancer. I believe she got the cancer from eating too much red meat, but that and raising eight kids and grieving over my father's death, I think were all contributors to her stomach cancer. Cancer is a very long and painful death. My mother expressed that her dying wish was to be able to see Lorraine just one last time because she missed her so much, but she knew Lorraine couldn't come to New Jersey. So miraculously, the hospital told my mother that they were full and they had to move her to a hospital in New York. And she was so happy to hear that. Now Lorraine could finally visit her. So Lorraine was able to visit her at hospice in New York a day before she died. And our mother received her dying wish and was able to die more peacefully. Growing up, some of my siblings were embarrassed of Lorraine and they feared that their friends would find out that their sister was a street girl. So they pretended she never existed. They never told their spouses that she existed later in life either, worried that they might be judged. I was not like them. Against their advice, I actually invited Lorraine to my first wedding with 150 guests. I didn't even care if I was going to be judged by my new in-laws or anyone else. Lorraine having a great day without feeling bad for not being invited once in her life was more important to me than any judgmental people that didn't know her backstory. I did secretly worry that she might catch the bouquet of flowers and the catcher of the garter would traditionally ride the garter up her leg on video and discover that she had no underwear on under a dress. <laughs> it was July, so I didn't have to worry that she would go into the coat check room and pickpocket the coats. But I put aside my worries because I knew that being included this day would mean the world to her. She was so honored and excited to be invited to a formal event for the first time in her life and be treated like a normal person. She glowed on the dance floor and danced so gracefully at the reception with a smile while twirling her lacy scarf. I wish I could show you the video of her dancing, but it's on an old VHS videotape somewhere in storage because it was back in 1988. She actually only had one funny moment there. Someone told me that on arrival to the reception hall, the usher told her the wedding venue will be in the gold dust ballroom and he pointed to the room and she replied, okay, but where do I get my filet mignon? She, she was excitedly looking forward to the surf and turf dinner because she never had food like that before. Even though the marriage didn't last longer than seven years and over the years I lost touch with all the people at the reception anyway, I'm so glad I gambled and gave Lorraine the best day of her life. Instead of worry about what others thought of her being my sister, as my other siblings thought I should. Now let me show you the event that got her murdered. Do you remember a story on the news back in 2006 about the bouncer in New York who was accused of raping and killing a college student? Here's the story, apparently it's still online. Well, I was home one day watching the news and I hear Lorraine House witness for the murder of the college student by the bouncer and I'm like, what? So in this New York Post article, it says a homeless woman who sleeps in the park, that was Lorraine, across from the bar told police yesterday that she saw the murder victim get into a dark van with Daryl Littlejohn, who was the, su the suspect at that time, early on February 25th. He pulled in around the side and then he went to get her. He put her in slowly. She staggered a little. She had dark hair. He was holding her because she was staggering. Then he drove away really fast, she said. And then it says Lorraine House 50. But underneath it, it says police had not determined if House's account is credible. Well, duh, after Lorraine told the story, she took it back and she said, I really didn't see anything. I just wanted the money that you were offering because I was hungry. When the reporter asked Lorraine if she saw anything and they offered to pay her to tell what she saw, she pretended that she saw the bouncer escort the college student 
that was raped and murdered into his van. She gave her full name in order to get paid. And I remember asking her on the phone, what was, what was all that about? I heard your name on the news. And she told me, oh, I was hungry. And the reporter offered me money to say that I saw something. So I did. But then after I told him, I really didn't see anything. I was just wanting to eat. So anyway, her false witness testimony was on the TV news and in print in the New York Post with careless mention of her name, her age, and what park she was living in as a homeless woman. And soon after, she was labeled a dry snitch, according to somebody who was helping me wrap up this vlog, who happened to know people in that park. And he told me that they went to the park and they offered her some free drugs, which turned out to be bad pills right before she was found dead on a subway train. So shortly after those pills were given to her, she was found dead on a New York City subway train. And because she was dressed in tattered clothes with no jewelry, the city workers assumed that she was just another homeless person that didn't matter to anyone. And they didn't even mention on the news that they found a body on the train. And they didn't make any effort at all to contact her family, even though she had ID on her. So my younger sister, Candace, wanted to know why she hadn't heard from Lorraine in a while. She was trying to ask around, you know, to see if anyone heard from her, only to find out that she was found dead on a train. And she called everyone to try and find out, well, what did they do with her body? And why was it never mentioned on the news? And nobody knew anything. The police said maybe she was buried in Potter's Field, where they, where they bury unknown people. And... We couldn't understand why our family wasn't even contacted when she had ID in her wallet. So eventually we found out that they just put Lorraine's body in a freezer and forgot about her for months. Now, if she had been wearing Gucci or Chanel instead of inexpensive clothes, would her death have been treated the same way? Probably not. It would have been at least mentioned on the news that a body was found on the train. And maybe they would have even tried to locate her family or even determine the actual cause of her death, but they didn't care. We still, at that point, did not know the actual cause of her death. We found, well, I found out later, making this vlog, that she was murdered. So we never even knew that her death was not a natural cause until I was making this vlog and I asked someone if they wanted to add anything. This guy had known Lorraine from the park and he said, well, the reason she died was because someone across the street at the bar sent someone over with some bad drugs to give her so she couldn't testify since they put her name in the paper and on TV and they actually told them where to find her too. No one will ever care about what caused Lorraine's death because she was homeless. Homeless people are forgotten. But every homeless person has a backstory of how they became homeless. Lorraine had a home, but she couldn't return to her home in New Jersey because of the bounty hunter searching for her after escaping Rikers Island prison for a crime she didn't commit. All because of that one night in that hotel lobby. A fall down a flight of stairs could happen to any one of us and change our lives forever. So I always feel blessed for the abilities that were granted to me every single day. In the end, we were able to give Lorraine a proper burial next to our mother in the family plot. Rest in peace, Lorraine.